You know, the intent of prayer is really to develop a deep and genuine relationship with God. But in today's culture of pop Christianity, we may have used prayer to serve our own needs instead. And we desire outcomes instead of desiring God himself. So instead of seeing prayer as a means to build relationship with God, sometimes we may have filled our own spirituality with, um, by being involved in, say, church activities, attend um, conferences, um, listen to many sermons, enjoying a good worship, whatever that means. Okay? And yes, we may even be praying and attending all the prayer meetings organized by the church. But despite all this, sometimes we still feel a sense of unfulfillment and a sense of spiritual burnout. Why is that so? Well, the question is, are all these prayers and these activities offered with a personal relationship with God? Or is it merely functional and self-serving? Well, I like this quote by um, Eugene Peterson. He says, We discover early on that we can pretend to pray, use the words of prayer, assume postures of prayer, acquire a reputation for prayer and never pray. Our prayers, so-called, are a camouflage to cover up a life of non-prayer. Well, brothers and sisters, have we been living in a life of non-prayer and yet am unaware of it? Has our Christian life become more about looking good, feeling good, rather than developing a deep and abiding relationship with God? So what is prayer? Well, prayer is actively seeking to develop our spiritual growth and our understanding of God. So today, we are going to look at Job to help us uncover how prayer helps us to grow from being self-focused to God-focused. Now, for the benefit of those who, are, who may not be familiar with, uh, uh, with Job, let me give you a very quick summary of his life. Uh, Job's life is a very depressing one, you know. Okay? Job was described as a righteous man, one who is blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Now, he also has a lot of wealth. He's very wealthy. He had seven sons. Three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 300 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. Now, I'm sure we'll like to have such a person in our midst, right? Maybe once in a while, he can give us some soup kambing uh, for breakfast or lamb chop for lunch. And when the MRT breaks down, he can activate his what, camels and donkeys and send us all the way here. No problem, huh? Okay. Right, but one day, Satan challenged God, all right? He asked for permission to inflict suffering on Job. So Satan said, of course, you know, um, Job will bless you. Job will be faithful because of all the blessings that you've given to him. If these were all gone, would he still continue to praise you? Would he still continue to be faithful? So... God allowed Satan to do whatever he wanted, except to take Job's life. So we see in chapter 1, verses 13 to 19, that all that he had, everything that he had, was just taken away from him in a matter of minutes, literally. Right. So everything, his livestock, his servants, and worst of all, even his ten children. So, what was left was his wife, no, which is not very encouraging to him. So, you know, but yeah, she was the only person left for him. Okay, but as if that was not good enough, Job also suffered physically. So we read here, right? Um, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted Job with painful sores um, from the sauce from his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. So you see, he was also physically tormented. From sauce from head to toe. I mean, 
You know, if I have a mosquito bite, wow, it's so uncomfortable. But can you imagine sores from head to toe? It's so bad, he had to use a pottery, a broken pottery to scrape himself. Right. So throughout the book of Job, from chapter 3 all the way to chapter 37, we see Job wrestling with the immense suffering that had befallen him. He spent 34 chapters of the book questioning God and demanding answers for his unfa- uh, un- unjust suffering and loss. So let's just read a few of these verses. Right, Job chapter 3 verse 1. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. 3.11 why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? 21, 7 to 8. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them. And it goes on. So, Job is like you and I. We sometimes question God and struggle to understand why things turn out so bad in our lives. Why are we treated with such injustices? whether at the workplace, in school, or sometimes even at home, right? Well, God finally answers Job from chapters 38 to 41. And it is in this context that uh, after this divine encounter with God that we arrive at Job chapter 42, where Job responds to God with a heart transformed by the reality of who God is. So today... We are going to look at Job's response and see how he grew from focusing on himself to focusing on God in the midst of all that had happened. In order to move away from looking inward to looking upward, the first thing we have to do is to have a heart of humility. So this leads me to my first point. Right? Job started by demanding answers from God. But how did God answer him? Well, God answered him with, by asking him questions in return. In fact, if we count the number of questions that um, God asked Job, there were about 70 of them. So let, let's turn to this uh, yeah, chapter 38 and read a few of these questions. 38, 4 to 7. Were you, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off his dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? So what is God doing? So basically, God is giving Job a science quiz. All right, he questioned, God, he questioned Job about the earth, the heavens, there are different creatures, and in fact, the whole of creation, basically. So you see, God did not reveal to Job what Satan did or what Satan asked for. Only we, the readers, have this backstory. And even at the end, Job was clueless. Job was not told about the, the encounter that God had with Satan. So instead of comforting Job, you know, and saying, oh, you poor thing, you know, yes, my heart also aches for you. I know it's so hard thing to suffer, you hurt me too. No, God didn't do all this. In fact, what God is telling Job is, look, if you cannot understand things in the physical world which you can see, then how can you understand God's ways in the spiritual realm which you cannot see? Right, so let's turn to Job chapter 42, verse 1 to 6, and read how Job responded to God's questions. Uh, do keep this passage in view because we'll be making reference to it. All right, so if you have your Bible, yes, please turn to Job chapter 42, verses 1 to 6. All right, I'm going to read to you. Then Job replied to the Lord. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, Listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. 
Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So, after all this questioning, Job finally gets it. And he says in Job chapter 42, verse 3, Surely, I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. So in th just this um, short verse, we see how Job came to the realisation that he is but dust in the entire universe. So let me break down this verse for you. I spoke of things I did not understand. So Job here admits that he had lashed out at God about his sufferings and injustice out of ignorance. Things too wonderful for me to know. Here he's referring to the mysteries of God's ways. God has shown Job that creation is full of wonders and complexities that the human mind cannot understand, cannot grasp. And this is a profound act of humility. This kind of humble prayer is immensely powerful because it aligns us with God's will and opens the door for His grace to work in our lives. Hence, the first point, prayer cultivates humility. You see, the issue with many of us is that um, we want to be in control, and we think that we can be in control. But the truth is, based on Job's example, we see that we need to approach God with a heart of humility. It is easy to fall into the trap of just treating prayer like a list of demands and complaints. But prayer really starts with humility, which is acknowledging God's majesty and our dependence on Him. Well, a story was told of a, a young student who visited the Beethoven Museum in Bonn, a city in Germany. So when she saw the piano which Beethoven had composed some of his greatest works, she asked the museum guard for permission to just, you know, play a tune or so on it. And after giving him a good tip, she played the Moonlight Sonata. So when the girl, you know, after that, after, when she was about to leave, she went to the guard and said, I suppose all the great pianists who come here want to play on this piano. To this, the guard shook his head and said, Paderowski, the famous Polish pianist, was here a few years ago. And he said he was not worthy to touch it. See, that's humility, right? Recognizing that someone is greater than us and we are not worthy before the Almighty God. And when we recognize that, we can only respond, woe is me, rather than wow is me. You know? In fact, humility is the cornerstone of effective prayer. The Bible repeatedly emphasizes this, that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Job's journey from complaint to humility teaches us that real growth often begins when we stop focusing on our own needs and wants and start recognizing God's goodness. So moving from self-focus to God-focused. This leads me to my second point, which is prayer fosters intimacy with God. Now once there was this guy, let's just call him Peter, all right? Now, Peter claims to be the ultimate expert on chicken rice. All right? He has read all the articles about chicken rice. He even knows the history of chicken rice, how chicken rice became the national dish, and so on. And he can tell you the exact technique to poach the chicken to its perfect tenderness. Oh, wow, right? Okay. Yeah. And he also knows the, everything perfect. You know, everything that he knows about chicken rice is to its perfection. Um, and he also knows where to find the best chicken rice store in every corner of Singapore. So one day, somebody asked him, Hey Peter, since you know so much about chicken rice, can you tell us where your favourite chicken rice store is? So 
Peter looked a bit sheepish and answered, Oh, I've never actually tasted chicken rice. I know a lot about it though. So, I mean, everyone was stunned, right? How can you call yourself an expert, know so much about chicken rice, but have never tasted it, right? And so, so this is exactly the difference between knowing about God and knowing God. You know, it's possible for us to know a lot about God. We go to church, we listen to sermons, we read um, Bible stories and so on, but never really had a deep personal relationship with him. Knowing all the details about chicken rice cannot be compared to tasting it, right? Okay, so just like the Israelites, they have seen all the miracles that God had performed. And yet, when Moses was gone for a period of time, what did they do? They very quickly replaced God with a golden calf. Why is that so? Because they have not developed a personal relationship with God. Job declares in um, chapter 42, verse 5, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. So Bible commentators um, explain that this part, my ears had heard of you, reflects Job's previous relationship with God. He had known about God, uh, through teachings, through traditions, through stories. Um, his faith was based on what he had been taught and what he heard or, and knew intellectually about God. He never really knew God, right? But he went on to say, but now my eyes have seen you. So again, Bible commentators said that this word see here is not physically seeing God, but it symbolizes a deep spiritual insight. So Job is saying that now he has a deeper revelation of God through his encounter with God. His faith has shifted from his knowledge about God to an experiential, deeper understanding of God. See, he started off by seeking answers, but God answered him, by allowing Job to find him. This is the kind of relationship that God desires with us, a close personal connection, which can only happen through persistent prayer. Now let's just pause and ask ourselves, have our Christian life become more about looking good and feeling good and behaving like a Christian? rather than developing an abiding relationship with God. If we say that our Christian life is about being with God, then our prayer life cannot be just another activity on the, good, on the list of good Christian behaviour. Prayer must be a way of life. But, you know, sadly, most of the time, there are usually more people in, in most churches, right? There are usually more people who attend church activities rather than prayer meeting itself. So two weeks ago, we had our corporate prayer meeting. About 40-ish people turned up. And, you know, in our church, in order to encourage more people to pray and attend prayer meetings, we have made it very creative. So you have physical meeting, we have Zoom meeting, we have what? House meeting. Okay, prayer meetings, right? So, uh, this is just to encourage all of us to come together as a body to pray. So, the question is, should we work the prayer meetings around our convenience? You know? Well, I certainly hope that in the next prayer meeting in church, this hall will be filled with people, not for the sake of the numbers, but because as a church, we want to belong to abide in the presence of God corporately. All right, so my final point is prayer transforms us. We see that as the story of Job unfolds, his transformation, a transformation is also taking place. While Job's situation at that point has not changed, we see that his spiritual understanding of God has deepened. 
After his encounter with God, Job has a new or renewed perspective of God. He no longer demands answers from God. Instead, he submits to the wisdom and sovereignty of God. Now, this is crucial for personal growth because when we pray, we are inviting God to work in our hearts, changing us from the inside out. It's not just about asking for blessings and things. It is about becoming the person God wants us to be. 42 verse 6 says, Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Well, commentators suggest that the word despise here, it does not mean that Job hates himself or he looks down on himself. Rather, he recognises his smallness, his weakness and unworthiness before a great God. As a result, he repented in dust and ashes. So again, the word re repent here indicates a change of heart. It does a turning away from his earlier anger and challenge towards God to acknowledging his limitations. His perspective of God changed and this transformation comes not because he gained his wealth back, but it came from a deep, prayerful encounter with God. This transformation in Job's heart is a testament to the power of prayer. When we engage in prayer, especially during such difficult times, God works within us, reshaping our thoughts, our attitudes and our desires. Prayer aligns our hearts with God's, helping us to see our situation from His perspective. So this shift allows us to move from a self-centered view to a God-centered view. You know, sometimes the greatest work God does in response to our prayers is the work that He does within us. He may not change our circumstances, right? He may not change our circumstances, but He changes us to make us more like Christ, teaching us to trust Him and deepening our faith. This inner transformation is the essence of personal growth. And Job's journey illustrates the development of his deep, abiding faith. At the beginning of his trials, Job's faith was rooted in his understanding of God's justice and fairness. But as his suffering continued, he engaged in deeper, more honest prayers, and his faith began to shift. He moved from a transactional view of faith, where good behaviour is rewarded and bad behaviour behavior is punished, to a relational view, where faith is about trusting in God's wisdom and love, regardless of the circumstances. As we pray and grow in our relationship with God, our faith matures. We learn to trust God more deeply, not just because of what He can do for us, but because of who He is. And this mature faith will sustain us through the trials of life. All right, I'd like to invite the musicians to now come on stage. I'm going to share a personal testimony. Uh, it may not be easy, so do seek your understanding. You know, when my daughter passed away six years ago, it was hard for the family. And yeah, I had my fair share of grievances towards God as well. You know? So, I mean, I asked God, how could you do such a thing? She was only 20 at her prime of life. And, you know, at that time, her faith was also just taking root, getting involved in <coughs> different ministries. But you just took her away. What good can that be? And at that time, <coughs> I was the worship director. 
So I asked God, can I still worship you? Maybe I should not be in this role anymore. You know? But the irony is this. It was in these difficult moments that I, that I found refuge in worship. You know, when I sat at my keyboard and just poured my heart and soul out to God, I found comfort, not answers. So that's shifting, right? Shifting from seeking answers to seeing God. Prayer is a place to rest with God in reality. It's a place of abiding. In prayer, we come face to face with the reality and the sovereignty of our Creator. Well, I'd like to invite us to close our eyes in a posture of prayer. The story of Job provides a profound understanding of prayer as a tool for personal growth. Prayer is not just another spiritual routine and practice that Christians are supposed to engage in. It is about abiding in God and growing in faith. As we reflect on Job's life, we are reminded that prayer is a journey not a destination. It's a process of continual growth where we learn to trust God more deeply and submit to His will and allow Him to transform us from the inside out. I'd like you to invite all of you to stand as we sing this song together, the closing song. And as we do, let's examine our own prayer life and if we have had a misconception about prayer let's come and ask Him to change us and help us to seek Him instead Come, please. 
live in me, live in me, O oh Lord. two months into pregnancy the heartbeat stopped and the Lord is speaking to you who raised a hand earlier can I challenge you to come forward 
And can I invite the deacons and deaconesses to come and pray for those who raise their hand? We should just come forward very quickly. Those of you raise your hand. Deacons, deaconesses, please come. Those of you raise your hand, just come forward. Can we have the music on, please? Let's sing together again. Come, just those of you raise your hand, just come forward. We want to pray for you. Just come. Just come. If you're too shy, bring along your friend, bring, bring along someone to come with you. Yes. Can we have the deaconess to come? Come, come pray for our sisters here. Anyone else? Just, just come forward, church. Just come, just come. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Olivia, can lead us in the song? Oh, yes. Let's eat, like eagles. Come, yes, come, church. Yes. Oh, yes. Here we are waiting, Lord. Can I have someone else to pray for? your heart's desire to long for Jesus you we'll just come alright just come we'll be here to pray with you come church this is the time when the altar is open yourself to you that we will grow intimacy with you our life is transformed and our lives living in humanity come Lord come live in me all my life takes very soon. Can I just ask all of you just to hold hands with the one next to you. Come, let's begin to join hands. And let's begin to pray for each other. You may not know the person on your left or on your right, but you begin to pray and ask the Lord to reveal to you. Come all across the sanctuary. Let's hold our hands and pray together. Come, let's hold hands. Come, church. Let's just hold hands. We are all brothers and sisters. We are all family. A spiritual family here at New Life Baptist. Yes. Yes, let's just pray. Pray, pray for the Lord to come and live in us. Pray for the Lord to minister to us as we minister to Him. Pray for the Lord to have a breakthrough in our lives, be it in our studies, in our relationship, in our workplaces, even in our family. Some of us may have children who have gone wayward and stopped attending church. Some of us may have friends who have backslided. Some of us who may be growing cold even here in this room. Let's begin to pray, church. Let's begin to pray. Father, you hear the press. You hear our desire. You know our thoughts. And therefore, as the word that go f- went forth, help us to live a life in humility. 
with deep intimacy with you and our life transform in Jesus name we pray Amen come church please be seated as we have heard the word being hit to us let us now hit to a pocket for a time of tithes and offering. All right? Uh, yeah, so can I ask the ushers to come forward? You know, offering is an obligation for all Christians. And if you are here for the very first time, uh, if you are a visitor, uh, you, you can just allow the bag to pass by you and pass to the person next to you. Ushers. For those of you who desire prayers and you are too shy to come forward earlier, do come forward in the front here for prayers. Uh, the pastors and the deacons and will be around to pray with you. All right. Um, immediately after the service is over, there is a, sh a short refreshment table just outside with coffee and uh, some pastry outside. So do help yourself. Uh, do spend some time to stay with each other to pray and to uh, get to know each other a bit more we are very early today it's only 11 o'clock we will begin our Sunday school at 11 15 all right so they give us a bit more time or maybe even 11 20 more time to interact and uh, slow down our pace get to know each other a bit more all right yeah 11 20 right yeah our Sunday school teacher said can we can start at 11 20 that's very good Just come forward. Congregation, would you please stand as we give thanks for the offerings and receive the Lord's benediction together? Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Though at times, like Job, our things are taken away, but Lord, you have multiplied it in Job. And certainly, Lord, we ask that we can give unto you a small token of our love in our tithes and offerings. Use it for your kingdom, O oh Father. Expand it for your kingdom. And that, Lord, through these resources, we plow to the areas that need and that they too would hear the gospel being preached. Now may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace and the love that shines from Jesus be with us all now and forever as you grow in humility, in intimacy and transform life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace and serve the living God with joy.